My name is Regina Horowitz. I am a survivor of five camps. I was born in Krakow, Poland, and uh, we had to evacuate because we had, in, toward end of 1940, my f father, my mother, my grandmother, myself being, I was underage, we received invitation to come voluntarily to the station. And they gave us one week time. And through that week, my father decided, it was our decision that we will leave. I was the youngest one of four children. My three sisters were working. They looked blo blonde, blue-eyed girls. I was the only one that looked Jewish, with dark hair and brown eyes. And uh, they were employed, and they, uh, and they had still their jobs. Being they, lo they looked like non-Jews, and they, the German overseers kept them at work. My father, my mother, my grandmother left Krakow through a Polish man who bought the tickets and took us on the, pla on the train. And we wound up in another city where my father had relatives, my grandmother had her sister and brother. And we wound up live, being there. This was still, quote unquote, a little free, country, free area. Uh, with my father, if we would have taken their advice and come voluntarily, we would have been the first some of the first victims in either Majdanek or in Lublin. We would have been the first piggy, um, the, um, we would be the first victim, victims there to be guests in the, tr in the trucks. And uh, this way I still had, had my parents two more years because eventually my sisters had to leave their jobs and they joined us when they began to make, to form the ghetto in Krakow. They joined us and uh, in 42, in June of 42, they, the Jewish police came in to our apartment and they left a message for my parents that in three hours, they'll pick them up again for resettlement. And they came for them, and I still see my parents walking just down the street. And um, we never knew what happened because that particular day, there was a transport of 7,000 to a place unknown. And uh, they killed on the spot 6,000 Jews on the cemetery. And as a child, I wish my parents would have been the people on the cemetery, but we don't know. We have no idea what transpired. After that, after that, I became I, my, I became of age, which means I was 18 years old, and I began to work as a seamstress. And uh, I took in my two sisters. I gave my mother's sewing machine to the manufacturer, Mr. Madridge, and. They accepted my sisters as workers too. And we thought that this is, that that's how it's gonna go on. They formed the ghetto in Tarnov. And three months later, we were walk, going, lining up to go to work. And uh, they separated me from my two sisters. They went one way and I had to run home because the Nazi was uh, his dog chased me back home. They gave me, a, they put a stamp on my ID card. Eventually, three weeks later, after the transport, I was ready to go to work. And uh, 
a knock on the door, and the Nazi, a high-ranking Nazi, with a Jewish policeman, were standing at the door. Please come with us. And I, and he says to me right away, if you'll be late for work, I'll escort you personally to work. And uh, I went with them. And he took me to the pol Jewish police station, which was in the center of the ghetto. And about nine or 10 high-ranking Nazis were standing in a row. And one of them handed me a postcard. And the way he handed it to me, I noticed that it came from Przeworsk, which was southern part of Poland. And uh, he asked me to, trans to read that card, postcard, if I recognized the writing, the handwriting, and translate word by word, which I did. And I'm sure by then they already knew the, what the card said that was from my sisters, who wrote, we are here, we are cold and hungry, but they promised us they'll take us and after the showers, we'll get food. And um, she wrote about 50 or 60 names of friends, their friends, the two of them, my friends, my school friends, and who is with them. They mentioned cousins and other relatives, about 50 names she mentioned and love you and goodbye. Then the Nazi extends his hand and wants the card. I says, may I have it? He says, no, this will be hanging here on the wall and you should see that these people are alive. They're not, wir sind ja keine Menschenfressers. That means translation of those words is, we are not people eaters, but I'm sure Knowing what I know now, now, I'm sure that at that point, my sisters and all those people that she mentioned in that postcard, that all these people were dead by then. Eventually, I found out that they were taken to Belzitz. And this was an extermination, strictly exterminating place. Life in town of ghetto was not a picnic because on daily basis there were victims. And I was very glad that I had my employment and I was living, if you call it living, that was living. The only thing was that our uh, overseer of the factory made sure that each of his workers get an extra bread through the week. And by doing that, I was able to become a barter and get a, pa a, a pair of shoes that fit me. And uh, life was not an easy task. On daily basis, there were victims. And finally, in, we lived there for another, about a year, after my sisters disappeared. And again, we were lined up to go to work. And my oldest sister was standing next to me. We were holding hands and the Nazi passed us by like this, separated us. My sister went on a transport and they counted off 1,800 of us. And we stayed overnight and they sent us to Plashov, which was near my hometown outskirts of Krakow. And um, that was a camp known for, for Mr. Frank, who was a good-looking man, very good-looking man, but the most vicious human being I've ever seen or I ever had to live under. From his house through the, on the veranda, he used to shoot into the camp on daily basis. Sometimes were five victims, sometimes were two victims, made no difference who the person were, 
who the people were. And uh, they ca I was working that there until August of 1944. We're coming from work. They took us immediately into the trains and we wound up in Auschwitz. Arbeit macht frei. Yeah. And um, in Auschwitz, as I was, they took us into, immediately were lines formed. The, the loudspeakers were giving directions. Old men one way, the young men the other way. The old women and children one side, the, the younger group on the other side. So I uh, wound up on the young side and they led us between the two crematoria and um, through the loudspeaker, undress, put your clothes in, in a neat pile. And when you will come out from the showers, you'll find your clothes untouched. And as I'm getting undressed, I hear a male voice behind me. Don't turn around. Are you so-and-so from Krakow? And I said, yes. Did you have a sister, Paula? I said, yes. Where is she? I says, Belzitz. By Mengele, remove your eyeglasses. I wore glasses since I was six years old. I was blind as a bat. If I wouldn't have my glasses on, I could have tripped over the German novi, not even knowing who I tripped over. And uh, he says, remove them. And that's how you pass Mangala. And I did. I removed, I held my hand over my eyeglasses on my thigh, and that's how I passed Mengele. No, fortunately I didn't need help. I was at that time seven, uh, 18 years of age. I could claim I am the one and only that survived Auschwitz with eyeglasses on. And I till this day I cannot understand. Twice a day I was twice a day counted. The Blokova had seen me on daily basis. The Nazis had seen me. I was working by the kitchen, putting the garbage, the peels and the garbage onto the lorry that the men were uh, taking away. And these are my glasses. And everybody had seen me with my glasses on. And nobody made waves. I had a, a guardian angel. <laughs> 